You can be seated. Uh, Good morning. I am Pastor Cody. I am the high school youth pastor. Um, And we have been in a series, we're we're coming to the end of this series called Becoming Like Jesus. And we've uh, charted kind of this course of different practices that we can do that help us become more like Jesus. So just as a review, if you haven't been here or you need a reminder, first week we talked about solitude. Second week we talked about surrender. Third week we talked about Sabbath. Okay, see a pattern here? Solitude, surrender, Sabbath. And now we're talking about mission. And it's like, what? Like, how does mission work? Like, aren't you supposed to, as a church, aren't you supposed to, like, market it so that everything is easy to follow? Like, the four S's, this is what you have to do. But here we are at mission, random M in here. And, and not only um, vernacular-wise is it strange, but I also kind of thought that this was the oddball out when we were planning this series. When I think about spiritual practices, I think of the things like, prayer or solitude or fasting or obeying the sabbath things like that that it's like okay i'm doing that in my personal spiritual walk with god and it connects me to the lord and so when i was given this topic of mission i kind of was like is that even one (laughs) like is that even a a spiritual practice that i do to make me become more like jesus And when I say it out loud like that, it's like, obviously, (laughs) obviously it is one, but I do feel like it's a little bit different from the others. And so we're going to figure out what does this word actually mean? How is it a spiritual practice that helps us to become more like Christ? So the first place that my mind goes when I think about mission and trying to define it in a spiritual context, I think about the great commission, right? It's literally in the title, the Great Commission. And this is a passage of scripture that many of us are probably familiar with if you've been around church or you've been around ministry or mission. Uh, I remember um, learning about some missionaries from my home church, and they were, that was the first time I heard about the Great Commission. They were talking about going overseas and, and, you know, speaking the gospel and building the kingdom overseas, and that was the first time I remember hearing this passage. But obviously it's come up a lot in life because it it is a command of ours to go and live our life on mission. So we're going to read that. It comes from Matthew chapter 28, and then we're going to see what that has for us. It starts, then Jesus came to them and said, so literally Jesus is saying these words, so we know it's super important. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So if we just kind of take like the meat from the middle, what people normally say is the Great Commission is, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. When we read that, most of us probably think like, good, that's a good mission. Like Jesus clearly knew what he was talking about. That is a, a good thing that we're supposed to do. But if you're like me, it's also a little bit daunting. Right? If we actually take, take what those words mean, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And, and when you're done making the disciples of all of the nations, then you also have to baptize them. And then you also have to teach them everything that Jesus commanded. That is a pretty tall order. And if you're here on Sunday morning in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, we're only in this nation right now. We're not all spread out across the globe, and maybe some of you have been uh, global missionaries at a time or have done some mission work abroad, but when I think about their Great Commission, I actually get a little, uh, a little bit hesitant because I'm just daunted by what that really means. And if I'm honest with you, I start feeling kind of bad because <laughs> I'm like, I don't know if I'm doing that type of mission. At least not every single day, clearly right? All nations, all the nations, there's too many of them. Some of them are so small, like I never even heard of them. All the nations. And so I love the Great Commission. I think it is a command of ours. I think it is a beautiful thing that Jesus has has asked us to go do. But if I only think of that as the definition of what mission means, then I'm going to leave feeling kind of inept because I'm not really doing that. And I don't feel like the Lord has called me to go be an international missionary. I think he calls some people for sure. 
but I don't feel that calling on my life, and so I, I'm wrestling with what do I do with that then? And for those of you that are not international missionaries, what do we do with our calling of mission? So anytime I need like a really practical understanding of what I am supposed to go and do, I look at the Gospels, right, the stories of Jesus, and I particularly look at the stories of the disciples, all right? And I probably preached on the disciples last time. I'm a big fan of the disciples because they are us, right? They are the people who were following Jesus and trying to make the gospel happen, trying to understand his teachings, and trying to go on mission alongside of him. That's you and me. That's, that's a description of a current day disciple as well. So they're kind of the people that I feel like I can relate to the most in scripture, and I can translate what they do into my life. Also, it helps that the disciples make a lot of mistakes, like a lot. They really don't know what they're doing at all, and that helps me. That makes me feel a little better. But just as a reminder, the disciples were these young guys, ages 13 to 21 is our best estimate. 13 to 21. That's super young. And, and probably only one of them was 21. Most of them were probably 13 to 18, okay? So the people that I work with, right? The students I work with, they're super young. I love my students. They're amazing. They don't always know what's going on, right? Teenagers don't always have it, and neither do we, right? And so we can translate those young guys who were just called, we can translate that to our lives. Also keep in mind that these disciples by profession and trade, they were fishermen, they were tax collectors, they were people who were working for their family business. So usually working under their father and whatever they did. A lot of them were fishermen, but they're working in their family businesses. And the reason that they were is because they weren't really good enough to go become rabbi, right? So everybody when they were young, all the Jewish boys, they would start learning the Torah, they would start doing all these practices, and they would try to, to get into uh, kind of the path that gets them towards rabbi, right? Because that's the spiritual elite. That's what most uh, good Jewish people wanted to be. So these guys, because they're fishermen and tax collectors and other things, a lot of blue collar working, we know that they weren't on the path to become rabbi. So they were not the spiritual elite, okay? So they're 13, 14, 15. They're not the spiritual elite. And they are the people that Jesus goes to and is like, you know what? <laughs> That's the one that I really want to follow me and do some miracles. That's the one. And so put that into our current context right now. If you were like um, an artist or a muralist, right? If you're a muralist out in some city and, and your job is to make all these beautiful murals throughout the city and you need to bring some people to apprentice under you, okay? And, and you've only got three years, okay? That's the length of Jesus's ministry before he died. You only got three years to canvas this whole city with beautiful murals. Who are you going to go pick? Okay, you're probably going to go into the art schools and see who's promising, okay, a promising young artist. You might even go to, like, the streets where people are graffiti and stuff, like, who's a really good graffiti artist? Like, you're going to pull people who have some semblance of experience or are on the track to help you with that mission. You're probably not going to go to your local mechanic and be like, hey, can you fix my car? But then also, like, I'm going to pick you to come be with me. Or like the dentist's office and pick like the dentist assistant and be like, hey, we're going to go make some big murals, right? That would be foolish and strange. You would go pick the people who are already kind of in line to do what you were trying to do. But Jesus does something totally wild and he goes to the people who are unqualified. And he says, you know what? You're not the people that are in line to be rabbi. You're not the spiritual elite but I'm going to take you with me, and just by the fact that you're journeying with me, you're about to be the spiritual elite, right? You're about to get a, a first-hand experience of these crazy things that we're about to do. So because Jesus picks these unqualified, almost it seems to us random, right? This random selection, I'm sure for him it was not, but it seems like this unqualified random selection of people to journey with him, it gives me comfort in knowing like, okay, I can do this too. Like, I, I don't have to be the most qualified person to go on mission with Jesus Christ. If you, in this room, have said yes to Jesus in any capacity, you are qualified, right? Almost overqualified 
to go on mission with him. These boys, they only had three years with him. Three years of walking with the person of Christ, okay? So if you've been a Christian for more than three years, you are massively overqualified to go on mission with Jesus. And so there's this like kind of dual thing that happens inside of me of like comfort in knowing that he picked people who probably we wouldn't have picked, but also a little bit of like uncomfortability in that I know I'm supposed to do it too. And so that makes it more important for me to really understand what mission even means if I know I am called to it, okay? So all of us are on the same playing field. Like, I'm not different because I'm, right, I'm down here. I'm on the same playing field as you guys. We are all literally called to be on mission. It doesn't mean I'm, I'm more called because I went into ministry. Do you get that? Can I get some head nods if you understand that? Okay. Because sometimes I think, we think like, well, I'm just the person sitting in the chair. I don't really have to, or I don't know him well enough or I don't read my Bible enough, or I don't know if my relationship with him is strong enough. If you've said yes, come on, let's go. So we're going to read a passage where literally the disciples do this, okay? So it's the, his first calling of the disciples. And what I want you to take note of um, is after he calls them and they say yes, which is kind of wild in itself, I want you to see how quickly they move into the mission part of things, Okay. So we're going to read from Mark chapter 1. It's a bit of a longer passage, so if you want to visualize what's going on here, whatever helps you connect to this story. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Sometimes I wonder, like, how Zebedee felt about that. <laughs> like, he's got his son. They're, like, going to take over the business, and they're like, bye, like, to follow a strange man. But I digress. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. Okay, let's pause for a second. We're about halfway through this story. Did you catch how quickly that happened? <laughs> he calls them, and then immediately they go, and he's teaching in the synagogue. So it's kind of like here, right? They go, and they're like, all right, I'm going to sit under Jesus' teaching, and they hear him teach, and then all of a sudden, inside of the synagogue, there's somebody who has an evil spirit. It's like, okay, I guess we're on mission now. <laughs> like, I got one sermon from the guy, and I guess it's time to go. And so Jesus is the one who, who uh, casts the demon out of this person, but the disciples are there with him, watching him do this. The disciples are already on mission. They don't really have time to kind of say, like, well, I don't think I'm prepared yet. Like, I, I need another teaching before I go. It's like, nope, it's here. The time is here. All right, let's go back in. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching? And with this authority, he even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about Jesus spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. As soon as they left the synagogue, now look at that word, as soon as they left the synagogue. So they just did this crazy thing where they cure this man, they bring the demons out of him. As soon as they left, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. Are you getting this? Like, literally, he, he heals someone in the synagogue. Then he goes just to one of their houses, and they're like, great, okay, maybe we can put our feet up. And someone has a fever, and so Jesus is healing. And then they leave the house, and all of the people in the town come, and he starts healing people, okay? It's continuous for Jesus. That evening after sunset, people brought Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. 
Now, one caveat I want to make sure we know is the Gospels aren't always known for being insanely chronological, okay? There's often things that we're going to miss. We don't really get the full picture of three years, day by day, everything that happened. But when you read the Gospels overarchingly and you look at the story of the disciples being called and then going into ministry, it's pretty rapid, right? There isn't a lot of hanging back, teaching, sitting under Jesus' teaching, and kind of training for this three-month period before they go on mission. It is rather immediate. And it's not only immediate, but it's everywhere they go, right? And, and Jesus is Jesus, okay? So I'm not equating us to Jesus. He, he's this guy who can literally do anything. And so obviously there's going to be opportunity for him to heal wherever he goes. But he chose these 12 guys to be a part of that with him. Come, watch me heal people. Come, sit under my leadership here, and then you're going to go do these things too. You're going to heal people. You're going to do, he says, we'll do greater things than he did, right? So he's training them by being on mission with them. And guys, if we're honest, that's not really what we do in church culture, okay? And I think I can evaluate it because I work inside church culture, but Church culture is usually we come on Sunday mornings and we learn, we sit under teaching, and then we go out and to varying degrees, we choose how much we want to enact what we've learned, okay? For me growing up, and I'm, I'm coming for me too, so if you feel like I'm coming for you, coming for us, right? When I was growing up, what I thought that meant was be a good kid and do good stuff. That was it. Like, just don't do the bad things. Don't swear. Don't drink. Don't go, don't go out and have sex. Like, just be a good kid, and Jesus will be happy with you. And I think what I missed as a young person was, like, that side of things that was like, but what am I supposed to do? I know what I'm supposed to avoid and how to be a moral person, but what is Jesus calling me to do inside of my high school when I was a high schooler? What was he calling me to do at Messiah when I went there? What is he calling me to do now as a person who exists all 24 hours of seven days, not just on Sunday mornings? I exist out there too. Like, what is he calling me to do? And so sometimes I feel like we can get so stuck in our church routine that we forget that really it's all about out there, what we do out there. And I'm not throwing church under the bus, obviously, because I work for one, so that would be silly. I'm not throwing it under the bus, but what I want us to kind of have a mindset shift about is church should really be our training ground. This should be our training center. So if you played some sort of sport while you were growing up, or maybe you play still, okay, and you wanted to be the best at that sport, you would do whatever you could to get good. You would go to a training facility. You would practice all the time. You would, you would work and work until your craft was really honed. But it would be really silly if you trained for that sport and then never played in a game. That would just, that would just be strange. You would be this recruit that's like, oh my gosh, we want him on our team. But, like, but he was like, no, I'm good. I'm good training. I'm practicing. I'm the best of the best here inside this training room but never played the game. That would just be bizarre. And I think that that's how I want to think about church here. I want to be trained here to go out and play in the game. And honestly, the game's out there, right? Like the game is with the people that you see every single day, the people that you work alongside, the cash registers at the grocery store, the people you pass in the street. Like the game is out there and I should be trained here. So that's the shift I've been trying to make in my own mind because I've, I'm a product of church culture. I, I was born in the nursery, essentially. Like, that's how I feel. I was like, wah, like delivered right into the nursery. Like, give me my goldfish and my Bible, right? So like, that's kind of my story. So I'm trying to like rewrite some of that to be like, okay, church is beautiful and good and rich and it fills me and it teaches me and it trains me. But then I need to go out and live and I need to live on mission even more out there than I do in here. I also sometimes think of it as like, um, I know some of us own Teslas, right? Those like crazy new electric cars. Okay, so I think of it sometimes as a, as a Tesla recharging station as well, like church. Like obviously if you drive a Tesla that's fully electric like, and you never recharge it, you're not going to get very far. It's not going to serve you well. So there are times when you need to recharge. Even Jesus, who was on mission constantly, drew away to be by himself. 
or drew away to be just with his disciples. You see that time and time again in the Gospels. He was constantly being like, heal, heal, heal. Okay, don't talk about me. Bye. And then he would go and be by himself with God for periods of time. And then he would go back into the field and go, go, go. And then he would withdraw. And so church can also be a place where you are fed and filled and recharged, okay? In order to go back out and do what you need to do. And so if this is our calling, if we're supposed to be people who who come to church, get trained in the ways of Christ, and then go be on mission with him, we need to understand what our mission is. And the tricky thing about this is that mission is literally different for every person in this room. I truly believe that. We've got scripture that helps us guide us toward the goal, but I don't know Mark Erb's life in and out. I live a very different life than he lives. So the people he's going to interact with and and the people that he's called to are going to be different than me. And so I want us to take just a minute and I want us to, you can close your eyes or not, it doesn't matter. Uh, I want us to think about where are the places that you find yourself consistently throughout your week? Okay, And, and let yourself think beyond just school and work. Find some other places. Where are the places you find yourself and what might mission look for you look like for you in those places. Take a minute. Okay, hopefully the Lord's bringing some things to your mind. I really recommend, if you don't already have um, one of the booklets that this series is walking through, please go get one at the end of this message. There's some in the back and at the Welcome Center. The booklet is going to walk you through even more practical kind of brainstorming of what that might look like in your life. It's a really good tool to help you find what that could look like. I'm going to share a personal story from my life, and then I'm going to ask some others to share some stories so that we can kind of place this in reality, right? So this is an example of me not living on mission well. Uh, I was just in San Francisco this past week. It's like my favorite city in the world. I love it. My best friend lives out there, and so I was was hanging out in San Francisco. This was my vacation, right? I'm on vacation. I'm having fun, Um, and we decided to go to this concert. Now, some of you might remember that like three-ish years ago, the high school youth ministry went to San Francisco on a mission trip, okay? And we stayed in this area called the Tenderloin District. It is um, the area that has, definitely has the highest percentage of homelessness. Um, it's kind of run down. It's a tough, difficult area. And while we were there, we went and ministered to the homeless in a ton of different ways. We um, brought food to different people. We went on walks and just had conversation with folks. Uh, We would invite them to different events that were happening. It was very interpersonal ministry, trying to bridge the gap between us and them, which is the mindset we often have. And it really worked. I mean, we were having conversations with people who were, like, currently shooting up. It was very interesting. I was like, I've never been in this situation before. And it was was really eye-opening and cool to be on mission in that location, okay? So fast forward to now. I'm going to this concert, and we get dropped off, um, and I, like, look outside, and I'm like, I think I recognize this area. Like, I think I was around this area, maybe for the mission trip. I recognize like a landmark or two. And we go to get in line for this concert. And I look at the door and the line is like all the way down the block. So I walk all the way down the block and then it wraps around the block. And I walk all the way down and then it wraps around again. And then we walk, and I was like, is this correct? And so I'm walking around this whole city block and I get placed in this, this block that's one block away from the theater. And I'm standing there and I'm waiting and I look around and I'm like, oh my gosh, I literally ministered on this street. Like, I was here in this exact street, like, talking to homeless people, doing all this stuff. But how do I translate that to what I'm doing right now? Like, now I'm one of the other people who is just trying to live my life, have a good time, go to a concert. So I'm waiting in line for this concert, and I I walk past a couple homeless people. and I have a guy ask me, like, do you have any money? And I was just like, no. 
and stayed in line because I felt weird. I was like, I don't really know how to do this. I'm not in the mission trip mindset. I'm standing near a bunch of other people who are also saying no to this guy. So if I like, I'm like, hey, let's have a conversation. Can I get you a meal? If I do all those things, like that's going to be bizarre. And the people around me are going to look at me like I'm strange. And so the, the societal pressure to kind of be normal for what the moment was calling for made me not live on mission. Like just completely. I just bombed. Whereas three years ago, in the exact same spot, I feel like I was actually building the kingdom. And the only difference was my mindset. There I was like, I'm on a mission trip. I'm literally here to, to help people and be on mission. Here it was like, I'm on vacation. I'm trying to see a concert, I'm trying to live my life, right? And so I had this ugly tension of like, ooh, I have to preach about this on Sunday. And I just botched it. Like, I just did a, a really bad job. And the reason I share that with you is because I think it's natural for us to go out into our places that we are not on Sundays and, and take on a different persona or think that missions has to be tied to like a service opportunity or a week-long mission trip or something specific that I'm going and doing to help people. That's when I serve and then the rest of the time is just for me to be me. And I really wish like we were people who could blend them. I really wish we were people that's just like, I live my life, I go to work, I see the people I see, but I'm also like at a moment's notice, yeah, I'm gonna build the kingdom in this way. I'm gonna serve this person. I'm gonna humble myself and, and serve this person. So that's like our goal, right? Is to connect those two parts of ourselves that sometimes we separate. The Sunday morning version of ourselves, the mission trip version of ourselves, and then the everyday version. If anything, this is where we're really on mission. So I'm gonna call up Cindy and Bob Lehman. Um, Cindy's gonna interview Bob uh, about his work, how he sees his work as mission, and Bob is gonna do a better job than I did in San Francisco of explaining to you what living on mission can really look like. Yeah, so Cody just gave us all uh, a minute to think about where the places where we find ourselves on a regular basis. And for many of us in this room, that includes our workplace. And so we've invited Bob Lehman to um, share from his experience what that looks like. And so Bob, as a realtor, you interact with colleagues, homeowners, potential buyers. And so what does that look like for you in your interactions with them to minister in your workplace? Let me make sure I'm on here. Testing. One, two. I believe I hear it. Okay. First thing I want to do, I am in the housing industry, and there's a little story that I came across the other day here that I'd like to read to you. My friends threw a housewarming party for me in my new igloo. Now I'm homeless. <laughs> okay, you got it? Becoming a realtor in 2006 was a very unique experience for me. I had been in the grocery store in business here in Mechanicsburg, a keeper's food market, and I was one of three owners of the business along with Sarah Martin, who I saw back here a while ago. She's, she attends here. And uh, Sarah's brother, Doug Kiefer, who now lives in Lancaster County. I was nervous about the tests that I would need to pass to get my realtor license. I was never accused of being an exceptional student, in a positive way at least. I have had some report cards that had some red letters on them. If you know, if you know where they are, I, I don't know if they do that anymore or not. It's not good to have them on a school report card. It is good to have them in a Bible because that's what Jesus said. My study habits were pretty much non-existent, and the teacher's comments were always not working up to capacity or potential. So I asked God to help me pass all of the tests I would need to pass the first time I took them. I thought that would be quite an accomplishment for him and for me but I felt this would be a, a sign to me that this is where he wanted me to be during this season of my life. 
we passed all the tests the first time. I took them, and that has been a valuable experience and, and assurance to me during these 16 years. I know where I am to be. I am told there are about 1,500 realtors in the South Central Pennsylvania market, so it is a competitive marketplace. How do I let my little light shine? I often will close my conversation with someone, whether it's in a text, a phone call, or an email, with, have a blessed day. And sometimes I get a response to that. I like to pray a prayer of blessing over my clients in their new home or after closing in the conference room if I forgot to do it when we were doing our walkthrough in the new home. You know, I look around me from time to time when I'm at work, and there are always needs. People have needs because of things that they're going through. It's my desire to let God use me more and more in meeting those needs in people's lives. And so as you are paying attention um, to those needs, as you have this um, openness to serve uh, through your work, are there things that you have learned about who God is through this openness to serve? About a month ago, I listed a house in New Cumberland that was different than, and, and different than usual because there was a tenant living in the unit. Usually when someone's selling a house, that's where they live, and they're going to be moving to some other place. In this situation, there's a tenant in the house. She's a single mom with three teenage children who has been there for 10 years. No one had any idea where she could relocate to. And when I talked with her, she would always cry. I would pray with her and just felt that God had her back. And I would tell her that. The house sold quickly and she found no place to move into. On Ash Wednesday, she was walking to Mass when a man from the neighborhood congratulated her for selling her house so quickly. She told him it was not her house. She just rented it. He asked where she was moving to, and she said she didn't know. He told her of a house two blocks away that the owner was fixing up to rent, so she immediately went to see the landlord and the house. She told him she would take it, but there was another issue. I did not tell you she is on permanent disability and Section 8 housing assistance. She told me more than once that because she was on Section 8 housing assistance, people didn't want to rent to her. They felt that she wouldn't do a good job of keeping the house clean. The next day, when she went, she went to visit him that day, and the next day, the man went to pick up all of the paperwork that he needed to get to get Section 8 housing. And that is where she is moving to. I just called her yesterday, asked her how things were going. She has people helping her pack, and she's getting ready to move. I had some thoughts that I thought might work for her. Nothing turned out at all. Here, God had her back okay. He had planned exactly where she was going to be going. And as I have prayed with her since that occasion, it's been incredible. She hasn't cried once. I was getting an inferior complex for a while there. <laughs> but she is anxious to get into the new home and to see what God has for her. And I had very little to do with it. And one final question is Cody shared um, his experience um, from San Francisco. Just, it's not always easy um, to, to be serving or to be on mission. And so are there any challenges that you've experienced in um, serving or being on mission at your workplace? I, I, 
I think the situation with, with the landlord here really taught me a lot about how little I may know about things that I think I have answers to. And what have I learned about who God is? One word I have been learning about in the past months is faithful. When we honor God, He honors us. It's just who He is. He is faithful. Thank you. Let's give a hand for Bob for sharing with us this morning. So I had the pleasure of having Bob as my realtor. Um, and I can confirm like who Bob is here, the way that he serves in leadership here, is who he is when he's being a realtor. Like I find myself putting on these hats, right? I'm a pastor now. Okay, now I'm just a vacationer. Now I'm just a whatever. Like, and Bob just lives the way that he lives. And I think opportunities like uh, this opportunity with this woman, I mean, they arise, but we don't always say yes to them, right? And, and Bob said yes to that, to being a part of that and, and helping her, trying to be a part of helping her find housing. And so really it's about our willingness to say yes outside of these walls and our mindset shift of like, every time I'm out there, I'm on mission, right? Wherever I go, whatever I do. Uh, McBick's vision statement is really sweet and, and it applies here. I'm gonna invite the worship team to come on up as we read this. Our vision statement, which we just kind of revamped, is we are disciples who bring restoration and wholeness to Mechanicsburg and to the world. So if that is our vision, our collective vision, not much of that talks about this, right? Like, we're not disciples who faithfully attend on Sunday morning, right? We are disciples who will say yes when the children's ministry needs volunteers and the babies need volunteers. Like, that's not in that. We're disciples who bring restoration and wholeness to Mechanicsburg and to the world. So really, so much of our vision takes place outside of these walls. And when we serve, we learn the nature of Jesus. We walk where he walked and we become more like him as we move and we act. So yeah, mission is a spiritual discipline because we're becoming like Christ when we choose to partner with him outside of these walls. And so I kind of just had like a crazy week of like, all right, Lord, I feel like I understand in a new way because I wasn't even sure if this fit into the series. And now you're like, oh yeah, it fits. And also I'm calling you to a lot more than you even realize. So we're going to close uh, with one song here. And as we, we worship, I want you to keep thinking on that question. Where is God calling you to in your everyday life? In your jobs, in your families, in the people you pass, where is he calling you?